Welcome to the JobX panel session on new technology and electronics industry job opportunities. In this session, we have representatives from the South Australian electronics industry who will be taking you technology, technology opportunities in a range of fields, including aerospace, defense, electronics, health, energy, and mining. My name is Wen Sung, and I'll be chairing this session. I'm the head of school of electrical and electronic engineering at the University of Adelaide. The format of this session will be as follows. I'll be introducing the speakers, and we'll be having short presentations from each of them. And then I'll be asking them a series of questions, and there'll be an opportunity for questions from the audience at the end. So if you have any questions, please make a note of that, and we'll give you an opportunity later to ask those. I have three panel members with me. The first is um, Dr. Ronald Grill, who is representing Electronics Industry Development, Adelaide. Ron has a Bachelor of Science degree in Electronic Engineering, a Graduate Certificate of Business Marketing, a Master of Science in Technology and Commercialization, and a PhD in Global Electronics Industry Development. He is currently the Managing Director of, the Te of Technology Management Proprietary Limited, and is also the Information and Communications Officer of the Electronics Industry Development, Adelaide. His business experience includes decades in startup and management, in manufacturing and marketing of high technology electronics products in Adelaide, including export to Silicon Valley. Now I invite Ron to give a short talk. Well, I've been talking to him. Uh, talking about the electronics industry today, and Got to be one of these, got to be that one, okay. First of all, let's establish what it does. The electronics industry here is an industry which you probably are not familiar with. Electronics probably suggests microwave ovens, television sets, iPhones, none of that is made here. Those are all made in foreign countries, in large volumes, and to standard designs. The electronics industry here does these sort of things. It produces Designs and build, it's a design and build industry first. Innovative, high technology electronics products and systems for Australian and overseas customers. Provides interesting and well paid careers and equal opportunity careers indeed for engineers, technicians, trade qualified and, for some, and some companies offer on the job training for people with no particular uh, previous experience. And I want to emphasize that this is an industry in which there are opportunities to start your own business. The products of the industry are made in relatively low volumes. These are specialized electronics products and they're used in all of these sectors, aerospace, biotech and so on. The level of electronics in some of these industries is very high, others are enabled. Some of these industries are absolutely dependent upon the electronic systems. They simply could not function without. The electronics industry does not make TV receivers, microwave ovens, or iPhones. These are consumer electronics products, and they're made in large numbers overseas. Size of the industry is important. There are 300 companies in the electronics industry here in Adelaide. These are typically small, locally owned companies. They're small to medium sized companies, and that's important, which I'll explain later. And there are also a small number of multinational companies, particularly in the defense sector. People like BAE Systems and Saab, you've heard of them. They're big, but they're foreign companies. The industry employs 11,700 people in Adelaide, and these are well-trained and well-paid people. That is twice the, mi uh, twice the number of employees in the mining industry. Revenue of the industry, the last figure that we have reliably is 2011-12, was $4 billion. Now, $4 billion, 4,000 million, it's a bit hard to sort of see the dimensions of that. So think of it this way, that's equivalent to the wholesale value of all 160,000 cars built in Australia in 2016. So the electronics industry in Adelaide, design and manufacturing industry, produced products that sold for an amount equal to all of the cars produced in Australia last year. And another interesting uh, uh, statistic is 
that Adelaide has 40% of Australia's electronics industry in a city with 5.4% of the population. Now, why is this so? Primarily because of the DSTO at Salisbury. Not only has it produced technologies which are now being developed and have been developed and commercialised, but it is a source of people, network people, who've worked together and during times when the, when the budget for uh, defence goes up and down, these people are shaken loose and they've started businesses. That's a very common basis on which the industry is operated here. Some of the, some of the companies in the industry are Miriota, and you'll hear from Alex in a few minutes, uh, and Innovar, Fleet, and other companies who make small satellites. In the agriculture field, there's MEA, and you'll hear from them, from Andrew later. Defence is BAE and those companies, you've probably heard of most of those, except Tenix, that's an Australian company. Uh, locally, uh, Kodan and those other companies you might never have heard of. You'll notice that some of them are in blue. They are the companies that are represented here with a display. And in the environment, uh, there's Andrew and his wind and water measuring systems. In the health field, LX Medical, they make lasers. They make lasers that are used for ophthalmic surgery and they dominate a particular area of that market overseas. And a new company in Adelaide, MicroX, makes a portable x-ray. It's on a cart, you bring it to the bedside, you don't take the patient upstairs or downstairs to the x-ray department, you bring the x-ray machine, lean it over the bed. It doesn't work in every case, but it, it substantially replaces the need to trundle off to the x-ray department. In the mining sector, there are companies uh, such as APC Technology. They make computers, not computers as you normally see them. These are boot-proof, bullet-proof, waterproof uh, that are used in uh, difficult environments, not only in mining, but also in the defence sector. Uh, and there's some other companies there. You might have heard of Codan, for example. You might have heard of Red Arc, uh, but there are many others there. But you don't need to know them. They make products that you may never use, may never see, may never buy. These products are sold business to business or business to government. So, in summary, it's a high technology, IP based, non consumer product industry. It's an advanced manufacturing, it's a knowledge age industry, along with biotech and avionics and the like. These are the, these are the, the, the new industries, the knowledge age industries. It builds products that are essential to most other industries, and it offers well paid careers, including overseas travel, with a degree from an Adelaide University, you can expect to be employed anywhere in the world. They're, they're very highly regarded, particularly Adelaide University. Uh, plus real opportunities to start your own business, and that's important. Of the 300 companies, about more than 200 that I have recently looked at were started locally by people like us. Had an idea, started a business, and they're still going. The electronics industry, uh, in summary, provides a collaborative and stimulating equal opportunity work environment with well-paid careers in a relatively, relatively future-proof industry. And future-proof is an important characteristic of the industry. Thank you. For our, our next panelist will be Dr. Alex Grant, who is CEO and co-founder of Miriota Proprietary Limited which offers global Internet of Things connectivity. He was previously a professor at the University of South Australia, and in 2004, he co-founded Cobda Wireless, a leading connected autonomous vehicle technology company. Miriota won the New Business category of the 2017 Telstra SA Business Awards, and Alex was the recipient of the 2013 PSC Entrepreneur Award and the 2008 Neville Thiele Award from Engineers Australia. Alex is the inventor of many patents for intelligent transport and wireless communications. He has published a book and over 150 technical papers. Please welcome Alex Grant. <laughs> right, who's heard about the Internet of Things? It's very bright here. Excellent, well done. So now who's ever been um, out of the city centre and you go to talk to someone on your mobile phone and then you're looking at it and it goes no service because you're kind of out bush or, you know, that's happened to me. I was up at Clare recently and that was exactly the scenario. So connectivity, we're used to it being ubiquitous here in the city, um, but 
in Australia, only 30% of our land is covered by cellular communications networks. So in the absence of connectivity, the Internet of Things stops being the Internet of Things, and it's just things with nothing. So it's just kind of boring old stuff um, without it being exciting and connected and doing all kinds of interesting uh, stuff for you. So there's a lot of industries in Australia and around the world that want to participate in all of the advantages that the Internet of Things offers, all the business productivity improvements, all of the cost reduction, risk reduction and things like that, uh, but they are stuck because there's no communication network. So, okay, you know, some examples in agriculture, and I think Andrew will talk a, a, a bit about some agricultural sensing uh, technologies. There's a lot of stuff there, ranging from monitoring livestock water right through to monitoring individual beasts. Um, tracking all kinds of assets for construction or mining and things like that. Commercial fishing, you know, out at sea. Environmental monitoring, oce oceanographics, marine science. Defence uh, in, you know, in, in theatres where you, know, you, you may not even be uh, controlling the communication networks. Uh, and then in utilities, in water uh, and gas uh, and electricity. So these, these are all, by the way, areas where Miriota has uh, deployed solutions for customers. So that's, I guess, a bit of the, the why we exist and what we're doing, making these kinds of things better through Internet of Things. So how do we actually do that and what, how is it related to electronics? So this is our uh, current product. It's a sensor to cloud interface. So it's a little piece of electronics that you can connect a sensor to and then it communicates at very, very low power which means it has a very long battery life, which is another important thing if you're installing this you know, out in the middle of nowhere. You can't be going to replace the batteries every five minutes. This little tiny uh, device communicates directly to a constellation of tiny satellites in low Earth orbit. And those little blue areas you can see uh, spinning around on the Earth, they're the, that's what the satellite can see from this altitude of about 700 kilometres up in space. So that's a picture of one of the uh, satellites. In fact, the one you can see on the screen is a satellite we're launching uh, early next year, um, which is the next one in this uh, set of satellites. These, we've got three that we use now, uh, and this is, this is actually will be our fifth one. We've got two, two launches coming up shortly. Uh, and this provides us with a global solution for, for connectivity. Now, now, that satellite you're looking at there is a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 30 centimeter box. So it's basically a flying shoebox sized computer in space, orbiting the Earth at seven and a half kilometers per second. Now, and it's about 700 kilometers away. So that, that's actually challenging from a, a, a wireless communications point of view. And that, that's some of the intellectual property that Miriota uh, developed to solve that problem and make the, all of that work. So that's kind of what we do. Uh, so uh, what kind of opportunities are there in a company like Miriota? So everything from the electronics engineering of the actual little hardware product that we've got. We've done you know, the detailed design of that right here in Adelaide uh, and manufactured contract manufacturing uh, internationally uh, through to uh, the software that runs in cloud and on the phones and tablets and computers that then presents the data to the actual customer. And in fact, a bunch of interesting stuff in between. So, you know, if you're into mathematics or physics, things like that, this is stuff, you know, if you're studying that kind of thing or contemplating studying it, it is the mathematics and physics of what we do that actually gives us our competitive advantage. So the electronics and the software is actually the embodiment of the idea that makes something work that you can then sell to someone and gives you this competitive advantage. So that's where the real smarts lies and the software and the electronics is actually the, uh, really the embodiment of that as something you can sell. And it's a very exciting place to be in where you can have a very direct and rapid line of sight from an idea um, which might be a mathematical idea uh, that then gets put into software, loaded onto some piece of electronics, and, and away you go. You, you sell that and make money out of it, uh, and ultimately improve um, someone's business through the product. Um, so that's all. Um, Miriota, um, we connect stuff.
to the internet via shoeboxes in space. Thank you. <laughs> Our last panelist is uh, Dr. Andrew Skinner, from, who is the Engineering Director at Measurement Engineering Australia. Dr. Skinner has had over 40 years of engineering experience in industries ranging from mining, renewable energy, and agriculture. He founded MEA in 1984 to carry out the South Australian Wind Energy Survey that pioneered the wind energy industry in Australia. MEA has since built many thousands of environmental monitoring systems with a recent shift to design and manufacturing of its own products to feed on-farm data to farmers. Andrew was South Australian Engineer of the Year in 2015, holds three engineering degrees, and is a Fellow of Engineers Australia. Please welcome Andrew Skinner. Now I feel like I've been launched. So uh, they've given me five minutes to convince you all that electronics is fun. And by hell it is. Um, I started in 1971. You like the nice juxtaposition between the 1971 and the 2017. So there's a lot of engineering years in there. And to last that long, you've got to continually reinvent yourself. If you're thinking of an engineering degree, then take away this message. You spend the rest of your working life studying. Put another 10 hours a week aside to study because technology and engineering are moving so fast that you're going to have to devote that time to your career to stay current. Let's see how that worked for me. So in 1971, I started a degree in electronic engineering at the old Institute of Technology, and there's a nice adage that I'll leave you with today. And it says that of all the grades between A and F, A, B, C, and D are those that pass. Those who get a D go off and do something else. Those guys who are just hanging in there as C grade students, definitely myself, start businesses. And they hire the A-grade students, the really clever guys, the nerdy guys in the class. They hire them to do all the clever work, and they front the business. And the B-grade students go off and join the government. <laughs> so I'm definitely C-grade, can't do maths. There's only one person in South Australia worse at maths than me. That's my kid sister. She's rubbish. But what I do have is a great imagination and the ability to do things. And the great engineers, and there's only 5% of the population fall into that category. Those are the guys who are the makers, who can imagine new things, who can make them, and to see how they do them. And in a company as old as MEA, which I founded in 1984 after six years in mining, I came back and I wanted to do environmental measurements. And, uh, over the course of three and a half decades, you have to be a startup at least half a dozen times. You have to keep reinventing yourself. And, uh, and you have to do that to survive and ride the waves. So in 1984, there were no wind turbines or solar generation stations on the Australian mainland. None. Zero. I had the dream, wandering around Europe and through Asia, that I wanted to be in that business. I thought, Clean green energy was the way to go. And I came back and angled the berth on the South Australian Wind Energy Program. And for three years, while I did my master's degree and lived in poverty with a, a wife and a baby son, I found all the wind sites in South Australia. Well, at least 30% of them are places where I put my finger on the map and said, here. And so I'm not doing electronics per se. I was doing measurement measurement in the bush, and that's what MEA has done ever since in its various reincarnations. So there I was, a pioneer in the wind energy business 30 years ago, and today, instead of uh, tree-hugging, sandal-wearing, bearded hippies, which is how we were seen back in the 80s, now the room is full of suits, and uh, it's wind energy, solar energy have become mainstream. When that all fell apart in about 87, 88, then I kept on, MEA was just me, and the company grew slowly and organically. And over the years, we built all sorts of measurement systems for the bush that measured stratification in reservoirs, evaporation in almond water, orchards, all sorts of weather stations, 
in all sorts of places. And here's some cute photos from many thousands of MEA systems that are now out there in the bush. So weather stations, uh, particularly for agricultural regions, are something that we've built here in Adelaide, out in McGill. We've churned out three or 400 weather stations for the public sector alone. And these are weather stations paid for by the government to let farmers tap into rainfall and evaporation records, wind speed records, storm records, someplace nearby. And here's just a few of them. Um, and these are feeding data continuously to the web websites where farmers can access them. And so this is, if you like, Internet of Things without the Internet. Um, but this is the genesis of what MEA is doing, measurements in the bush, and natural precursor to Internet of Things. Uh, when the wind industry collapsed in about 2012 with uh, the arrival of Joe Hockey and Jeff Abbott, uh, Jeff, whatever his name is, I try to forget the guy. Um, they killed off the wind business. The air went out of it. There was no more confidence. Our business died. At that point, we reinvented ourselves in an area that we'd worked in for many years, which is agricultural measurements, from very simple sensors right through to the modern product where we've invested some million dollars or more in creating an internet of things where the farmer can access what's going on on the farm from anywhere and any time. So he might be sitting in the doctor's waiting room waiting for, to get in, or he might be in Heathrow Airport. From anywhere in the world, he can take his phone out of his pocket and check the irrigation, the climate, back on the farm. And so I've interested myself in agriculture. Had I not been an engineer, had I not been born to a landless engineering family, in the city, I would have been a farmer. So my, I really like farmers and farming, and so that's kind of driven the company, and I'm the company founder, to be interested in, in that. So over the last four or five years, using electronics, mechanical engineers, industrial designer, communications engineer, in fact, every damn flavor of engineer that you can put your hand on, except for mining engineers, we've created an internet of things system out of Adelaide that's now all over Australia, and this is called Plexus, feeding through Zigbee networks and 3G and cute terms like that. And we've got good guys on the ground keeping this stuff up, and lots of farmers logging in. Uh, and we've created that using uh, technology that is radio linking across a farm and skipping soil moisture and climate data across to a hub that uses 3G backhaul and pushes data up to GreenBrain, our web application. Uh, down in the bottom right there, you can see all of the different farms in the irrigated horticultural, viticultural areas around Australia. So you can see with a little knowledge of electronics and a lot of knowledge about people, something that us sea graders are quite good at, and a whole bunch of grit and fortitude to stay in business, um, you can create businesses that use technology and use all sorts of engineering skills to uh, get data to farmers. So there we go, GreenBrain has passed a half a billion records um, and we're putting up about 100 records every second, 100 new records. And so here's my last slide. I've been at it for 35 years now at MEA where to from here? Is the job done? The job is nowhere near done. There's so many things that can be measured on farm alone, out in the bush. Alex has shown some of them. My interest is in the irrigated agriculture. And one of the sensors that I've worked on personally for 28 years, almost obsessively, is a sensor to get the plants to do the talking. Instead of measuring the soil and the climate, which are surrogates for what the farmer wants to know. He wants to know whether his crop is going into water stress. I've created a sensor that can plug into the plant and tell the whole picture. And of course, we've built the backbone with Plexus and GreenBrain to get that data to farmers. So there you go, from a crummy electronic engineer, uh, engineering uh, space way back, we're in the Internet of Things. We've rolled out the first wave. The next wave, however, will change. And this industry changes quickly. We'll have to go to satellite. We'll have to go to the uh, telco terrestrial networks. 
and we have to invent a whole new range of product, we have to drive the price down, we have to get customers to sign purchase orders because in a mature business you have to have positive cash flow to feed the staff, to service the gear, to do all the things real businesses do. It's not like a startup, you can't just burn cash. You have to find customers and create jobs and do that. And so I guess that's what I should go back to the office and do. Thanks for your time. Well, it's, um, it's been interesting hearing different perspectives of the electronics industry in Adelaide. Now, I've got a few questions to ask the panelists. And perhaps I'll start off with, first of all, asking them what attracted them to the electronics industry in the first place, and what was their first job, and how would they learn out of that? So perhaps, Ron, what attracted you to enter the field? Well, I got into it as a hobby, mm -hmm. which you could do in those days. I'm not sure it's possible these days. Uh, the first job I ever had was part-time, working in a small uh, factory behind a shop where they built radios, ah. radiograms, and these nice polished wooden oh. cabinets okay. with record players, discs. Don't worry about it if you don't know. <laughs> uh, they were the big black ones. Um, and I learned to twiddle the cores on the top of the aerial and the, in, and, and the other various tuning functions. Yeah. I thought that was great. I thought I was, but it changed. And here we are. Here we are. It all went wrong. Alex, how about yourself? Yeah, so for me, um, very much making things. And I think today, 2017, the path to uh, electronics and software engineering via making things is stronger than ever, that what you can accomplish as a kid today with stuff that you can get your hands on for almost no money mm. is incredible. Building little robots and you know, mm -hmm. doing stuff uh, is, is things that I wish I was a kid today because uh, the um, standard and ease of access to that kind of technology is amazing. So for me, um, it was about mucking about with computers in the 80s uh, and then realizing through high school I had a bit of an analytical bent, which then put me in the direction of engineering. Uh, I did a lot of uh, software development mm -hmm. uh, jobs during school and university, um, kind of game development, things like that. Um, but then over time sort of progressed down a, what, a, a theoretical path. Um, so there's a sort of far end, mathematical theoretical end of electronics engineering that I was in, PhD, postdoc in, um, uh, a university in Switzerland, uh, and then came back and you know, university staff in a couple of companies. But yeah, really, that what I find the most interesting is the interplay uh, between idea and making the thing, um, and uh, either personally or then with a team that you can just do things that you can't do by yourself. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. Andrew. So uh, you'll all recognise Alex here as an A grade student, <laughs> not C grade. <laughs> um, my dad was an engineer. He trained in the hard school of engineering in a country garage in Meriden in Western Australia. And uh, he had the knack. About 5% of the population have this ability in their hands to make things. Even the imagination to make a technology of today fosters that. Uh, Dad came to South Australia and he had half a dozen kids. Of those six, only I inherited the knack and the other five got 50 thumbs between them. <laughs> so I always liked pottering around. Dad was a mechanical engineer, as I say, started his own business. I'd like to, I was going down that route when in year 11 I saw the man, Buzz Aldrin and uh, Jeff, uh, what was his name, Armstrong, Neil Armstrong land on the moon and mm. everybody else is thinking, well, them spacesuits are cool. And I'm thinking, how'd that signal get from the moon into that box? Mm. And, uh, and so I went home and told Dad, sorry, Dad, I said, machine age is over, I'm gonna do electronics. Mm. And I've never regretted that decision. So that's, that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. What are, uh, a question like next question I'd like to ask the panel is what are one or two future growth areas in new technology and electronics in the electronics industry which particularly interests you and why? 
I think Alex is well qualified to answer that one. I think, well, I mean, biased, but the whole uh, new space uh, era is on us. So uh, if we were talking 10 years ago about Adelaide startups having space programs, mm -hmm. you would just think that's complete nonsense, that's mm -hmm. never going to happen. Space missions are things that NASA and European Space Agency, it's all about people on Mars and going to the moon and so on. Uh, when in actual fact, the uh, barrier to entry to do things that are in space is coming down incredibly. Uh, and it's, it's in reach of startups. Uh, and then, you know, the, what you can then do as a result of having what are basically computers flying in space with sensors on them uh, and communicating with them is really exciting. So, you know, here in, here in Adelaide, there are companies like ours doing communications things. There's people doing 3D printing of rocket engines. There's a, I, think, I think there's five different companies I know of in Australia with plans for launching, uh, having launch vehicles going out of Australia. Uh, that, that's, that would have just been absolutely, well, science fiction 10 years ago and, and not even contem be able to be contemplated in any way. Uh, and so the, that's something that's very exciting, has a lot of uh, opportunity and, you know, really as, as a um, aspirational thing to get into, uh, I, I think it's great. Huh. Mm. Yeah, and Alex, I think that's the modern world. To me, the modern world looks like a whole bunch of kids sitting in front of computers, <laughs> and uh, and it's all software and uh, and internet and web apps and phone apps and uh, that's all I hear. And and that's the new world, and that's where if they're starting today, that's where they have to be. You've got to have a degree. That's the driver's license to get started but the whole world is, is driven by software. But for me as an electronics engineer, software is not electronics and electronics is not software. My interest lies in mother nature. I'm interested in all the things that happen in mother nature that you can't measure with industrial sensors. The rate of gravity waves underneath reservoirs, the movement of water in the <coughs> swash zone of beaches, the flow of sap in plants. These things happen at really slow rates and nobody can measure these things. But there's so many interesting challenges in, uh, in Mother Nature that old analog electronic engineers like me can tap into that. <laughs> and, uh, and for me, sensors are the interesting thing. You know, I hope to spend my retirement in my own lab working on a whole bunch of fascinating ideas that are just wait to get me out of company management and get back to the lab so I can actually work on these things that I've understood for so long and yet haven't had the chance to work on. So I'm going in the wrong direction completely and shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, my next question is, what training and qualifications are valued by employers in the technology and electronics industry area? Well, certainly uh, degrees in electronic engineering um, and I'd have to say Adelaide University would be a good place to start. Uh, but there are also uh, many jobs for people with uh, TAFE qualifications, particularly their diploma or advanced diploma. And indeed, that's a very good place to start. Uh, if you didn't quite make the TR cutoff score to get into your chosen uh, university, then uh, you can take a, uh, an advanced diploma and that can be then used, give you entry into the degree course after two years. Uh, those rules tend to change and they need to be checked on a regular basis to see what is required. Uh, but certainly uh, at the top end, uh, a degree, certainly a bachelor degree, and then uh, maybe if you're inclined, uh, postgraduate degrees are available. Mm -hmm. uh, but postgraduate degrees, I think probably are most usually studied while you are working. Okay and uh, the work that you do in a master's or PhD program typically relates to the work that you've been doing and becomes part of it. Yeah, so from, I can just speak of the perspective of the couple of companies I've been involved in. Um, so the answer is a little bit, it depends. Uh, definitely, so at Muriota, 
uh, everyone has at least a bachelor's degree. Um, that ranges from electronics or electrical engineering. We have staff with computer science degrees and mathematics degrees. We have staff with commerce degrees and finance degrees. Uh, and then ranging from bachelors through to masters uh, and uh, we have four PhDs in the company. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the um, degree is, is one thing. Um, the thing which is a little bit of a ticket to play sometimes, the thing that we really look for is the person mm -hmm. and, and uh, their nature and really their, their capability. So some people can be very highly qualified and it counts for nothing mm -hmm. and vice versa. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, getting into this space, uh, yeah, degree is really uh, the first thing to, to go after. Yeah. So uh, if I'm interviewing for an engineer or a technician, of course he's got to have the degree or the, the TAFE mm. certificate. He's got to have that. You don't get to play in the game yeah. unless you've got some basic qualification, unless you can prove to me as an employer that you've actually stuck out something long enough to get through it, that you've done your homework and that you've been checked out against all the other kids. But that's the value of it. it it's just an obstacle course. You've passed that, you get to the gate, and that's where I'm starting to look for other things. Um, and the other things that I'm looking for are Firstly, has he got a personality? Because some folk who turn up have got none, and, and they'll never fit into the team. Hmm. Being part of, of the company culture is absolutely essential. If they're not going to fit in there, then I have to put them out on the footpath straight away and shut the door behind them. Because if I let them in, they cause such discord and, and, and discomfort and management time wasting. If you've got the wrong personality and doesn't fit the rest of the corporate culture, then the hours of anguish mean that all your good people leave because they get fed up, they're highly employable, they're mobile, they can go anywhere else, and that's where your company falls apart. The time to stop them dead is in the interview room. So let's say they've got a personality, they've got the qualifications, they've worn their best suit, uh, they've got past the initial shakedown. What I'm looking for then is, do these people actually have any skills? Have they got common sense? Can they talk? And so I, I ask them a whole bunch of real basic questions and I make, I make them terribly uncomfortable. And I'll take them in the workshop and make sure they can drill a hole and put a bit into a, into a drill without catching their tie in it. And real basic stuff like that, you know. And what I'm looking for are the makers. Again, the makers. One guy fronted up and he said, I said, well, show me something you've done that you didn't do at the university because you had to do it. Show me something you did in your own time. He got out, he, he wound up YouTube and he said, look here, he'd taken a lawnmower and he put it inside a, uh, uh, an old wheelchair frame and he'd automated the lawn mowing so he could sit there and he could <laughs> mow the lawn from his, his thing. And you know, it was a piece of rubbish. And, uh, but I thought he's the guy and he's still with me and he still is the guy. He got that mindset. <laughs> this guy was going to have a go. And that's what I'm looking for, that, that sort of a guy. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, uh, that wraps up the questions I have. We've got about 10 minutes for questions from the audience, please. So. Yes. Thanks. Um, I, I've got an engineering background. Uh, I'm just aware of the extent to which uh, software is eating the world. Uh, and this question is basically sociological. What, to what extent do you think the advent of things like um, machine learning, I'm thinking of convolutional neural networks, to what extent do you think that's going to in, uh, usher in uh, an increasing need for uh, universal basic income? Universal. Uh, that's a pretty far-reaching question. I think um, increasing layers of abstraction is what makes technology work, in my view. So as electronics engineers, mm -hmm. you, you, you think you're at the bottom layer of doing stuff with circuits. Well, actually, you're not. There's, you know, there's quantum mechanics that then it sits underneath semiconductor physics that then you make components out of that then you put into circuits and have you know, 
circuit analysis that then, then you aggregate into systems that you then put together, that you then control with microcontrollers or computers that you write software on mm -hmm. to then run algorithms that maybe are in the cloud that then you put machine learning on that eventually does something useful for someone and our capability to do stuff actually is really driven by our ability to abstract. Um, machine learning I regard as uh, a signal processing method that does useful stuff but we don't understand how it works. <laughs> Yeah. Not, not all technology is good. You know, we can go off in the wrong direction, but I don't think you can turn technology back either. Right. I mean, there is machine learning offers some opportunities to be able to, uh, for, it, for systems to be able to recognize issues based on training data that we've got. Yeah. But one challenge. So, for example, need a Japanese speaker. Say, use the command with the Japanese is better than their Japanese. This is something I don't know. Right. Thank you for that comment. I will move. There's a question over here. Hi, I work in a senior secondary campus in the northeast of Adelaide, and we've got some uh, trade training centre that has some rooms that are specifically set up for electronics. Yeah. Um, over the next five years, one of the things that I really want to do is reinvigorate this space for students, not only in lesson time, but also outside of lesson time to experiment and have a bit of fun. What suggestions or recommendations would you have for me to get that going outside of course talking to the students and finding out what they want. Um, this is probably an area where our students are, have probably disengaged or the, the rooms have been underutilised so there's some promotion that I need to do. Mm. What, would you, what would be your recommendations or suggestions to get these jobs into the forefront of students' minds? Perhaps Ron, would you? One suggestion that I think would work for you is to find a local firm in your area and there are a large number of electronics companies out in your region and you won't find every one of them will love the idea but you'll find one that does or two and then he might bring some friends along and they'll be prepared to spend the time uh, your t and, and work with you in your time to, to show the kids the kind of things that are really worthwhile uh, the alternative of course is you buy some Dick Smith kits and they get soldering irons and put them together that is not very useful, I'd have to say. It keeps their attention, keeps them quiet for not very long, but it doesn't teach them very much. By getting a local firm or a couple of firms in, you put them in touch with potential employers and with people who can tell them what is required in the real world. <coughs> you don't, in, don't underestimate the value of role models. Um, of mentors, of old guys, you know, there's a lot of old guys in the community, most of us. Um, these old guys know stuff and have got time on their hands and are happy to teach and that sort of one-on-one -on -one contact can make all the difference between a kid going down an engineering path and going off and doing some other thing. Um, so really you've got to find, you've got to find someone they look up to. I've got people I've looked up to, and if I read their history, they've had people they've looked up to, and it, and it flows back. Um, yeah, I think that one-on-one -on -one thing, or, or one on a small number, you know, you're not going to get every kid interested, but there'll be a small pool, that 5% of the population who love that sort of stuff. For them, 
that's what they want to do. All the reading, writing, and arithmetic in the world is not going to appeal to them like hacking something together. I know yeah. from my own experience, I got into the electronics area from doing a high school course where we made our own transformer. We got copper wire and we wound this little transformer. We put it together and it worked. And I was so excited about that. I said, wow, electronics is the area for me. I can build things which work and do stuff and charge batteries. And, mm -hmm. and it's just getting that, that sense, which I think you've gotten from the other panelists about the fact that you make something which works and you realize how exciting that is, that empowerment. <coughs> other questions? Nice. Testing, yeah. Hi. Um, just got a, you touched on uh, TAFE um, a few minutes ago. Um, now I was just wondering for people that have say got an associate degree um, in electronics at TAFE, um, is there uh, you know maybe they're not inclined to take that next step to university, or maybe they just want to get out there and start working, and maybe consider adding the university degree later. Is there a, are there job opportunities out there in you know Adelaide, South Australia, for people like that? Uh, well, if, if I may, from first-hand experience, my very best guy has got an associate degree. The company sent him off once or twice a week for a whole decade, and he rose from apprenticeship level right through the ranks of the TAFE, through the associate diploma, mm. to the associate degree, which gives him two out of four years university. Mm. And there he stopped. You get worn out from studying, from the late nights, from the weekends, doing your homework. All of that stuff wears you down. But along the way, he's been embedded in the R&D group, in the industry, lots of skills, absolutely way better than any graduate engineer I could hire of the same age. Um, and yeah, I, I wouldn't be hanging too much on the fact that he's got that far and no further, because that little extra further wouldn't actually mean much, because he knows so much. Mm. There's a whole piece of learning on the job. And no degree can set you up to be job ready. You've actually got to find a job. And the advice an old guy up in Mount Isa Mines gave me as a young buck engineer, he said, look, first job you get, take what you can get. Second job, you choose. Mm -hmm. And so when you get into that second job, you can really learn on the job if that's what you want to do. And that's the way you grow your skills. And once you've started there and you've passed that first six years or so where you've actually uh, become comfortable with doing the job, that's when you have to start learning again. That's when you have to start putting in your 10 hours a week of extra. Whether you go to the TAFE and do it there or whether you buy the books and read them at home or, or do it over YouTube, it doesn't matter. You really have to keep running to stay even within cooey of being relevant in, in this business. It's a hard game, but it's a lot of fun. So associate degree, yeah, they're good guys. I'd have more of them if I could. They put in a lot of hours at the TAFE and they, they, they grill them hard. To get to that level, they've got to have good math skills, good physics. They've got to build a project. They've got to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, that's a whole plethora of skills that's valuable. So I, I'd be looking for those fellas. Is that you? Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Did you want to oh, add? See me after. <laughs> okay. Well, I see we are out of time at the moment, so I think we should wrap up. I'd just like to, our three panelists today have been Dr. Ron Grill from Electronics Industry Development Australia, Dr. Alex Grant from Miriota, and Dr. Andrew Skinner from Measurement Engineering Australia. Could you please join me in thanking them? Ron has some brochures about electronics opportunities in uh, Australia, in Adelaide. Would you like to talk about that? It's a, it's a brochure that tells you uh, about some of the companies in the industry, something about the industry, and it's a very useful resource, and it can link you to our office where more information can be obtained. So thank you for attending this session, and we hope you enjoy the rest of JobX.